Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll get started at 2 p.m. Eastern time.
All right. Thank you all so much for joining us. We're going to get started here. Okay. So we've made it through an entire year of community webinars. So thank you for joining us today for our eighth and final webinar of our community webinar series. My name is Julia Wood and I'm the Director of Professional and Community Education here at the Lewy Body Dementia Association. Before I introduce our presenter, I would like to tell you about the LBDA. Um, LBDA is a national nonprofit that was started by care partners 20 years ago, seeking answers and support in their journey with Lewy Body Dementia. We provide Provide education, support, and drive research efforts at improving the lives of families with LBD. A few housekeeping items today before we get started. You are welcome to submit your questions anytime using the Q&A button on the bottom of our screen. I also have pulled questions from the registration, so thank you all that sent questions ahead of time. Um, following the presentation and activity today, our presenter will answer questions for about 15 minutes. This presentation is being recorded and an email will be sent to those who registered in about one week. To watch the recordings of any of our webinars that you've missed, you can visit our YouTube channel at LBDA TV. Also, when you leave the webinar today, a brief survey will appear asking your feedback about today's presentation. Please take a moment to complete the survey to help inform our content in 2024. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, um, Chair of LBDA Scientific Advisory Council, Dr. Jennifer Goldman. And I'm so proud to call her a colleague and a friend. You guys are in for such a treat. Dr. Goldman is a movement disorders neurologist with specialty certification in behavioral neurology and neuropsychiatry. She's quite a unicorn. Her clinical, research, her clinical and research work have focused on defining clinical features and operationalization, <laughs> say that three times fast, of diagnostic criteria for dementia, mild cognitive impairment, and psychosis for Lewy body disorders, identifying neurobiological mechanisms via, neuro, via neuroimaging biomarkers, and improving pharmacological and non-pharmacological treatments and care models to optimize functional outcomes. Dr. Goldman is currently the chair of LBDA Scientific Advisory Council and Industry Council, and over the years has directed two LBDA Research Centers of Excellence. She is also the secretary-elect for the International Parkinson and Movement Disorder Society. Dr. Goldman previously was the section chief of Parkinson's disease and movement disorders at the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab and professor of Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine in Chicago, Illinois. Please use your reactions button at the bottom of your screen to give a warm welcome to Dr. Jennifer Goldman. All right, welcome Jennifer. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get this pulled up for you here. Oops, that's not the right one. <laughs> All right, so give me a second here to share screen, you guys. We'll get this going. All right, there it is. All righty, so we'll get to the top. And then I'll give you the slide controls and you'll be ready to go. All right, you should be ready to go. Welcome, Jennifer. <laughs> thank you, Julia, and thank you to the LBDA for inviting me to speak today. And today we will be talking about the role of dopamine transporter imaging in the diagnosis of dementia with Lewy bodies. Uh, these are my disclosures uh, and I also wanted to note that the content for this presentation was created independently. And so without further ado, we'll go into the learning objectives for today's session. So the first is to define what a DAT scan is uh, and describe how it is administered in a healthcare professional setting to describe the role of dopamine transporter imaging and the DAT scan in the diagnosis of dementia with Lewy bodies. And then to summarize the, the benefits and limitations of this technology in the diagnosis of dementia with Lewy bodies. This is a brief outline of what we'll cover today. And for starters, I wanted to share a little bit of background, uh, some vocabulary, make sure we're all in sync and on the same page. I'll talk a little bit about the history of dopamine transporter imaging and how it's evolved over the years and then really dig into the ins and outs of DAT scan and dopamine transporter imaging, the what, 
how, why, who, and when uh, to use it and its uses in various neurologic conditions, including those with motor Parkinsonism and cognitive impairment. And then a little bit on the benefits and limitations, and then I'm happy to take any questions. To start, and some of you may be well aware of this, but in case you are new to Lewy body dementia, I wanted to provide some background uh, briefly so that we're all on the same page. So not all dementia, as we know, is the same as Alzheimer's. And here we're today going to talk about Lewy body dementia. And Lewy body dementia, you'll see also abbreviated as LBD, is the third most common dementia and the second most common neurodegenerative dementia, affecting about 1.4 million people in the United States. And in some regards, and you've probably heard me and other people say this, it is uh, like the most common dementia that most people have never heard of. And today we're gonna talk more in detail about how to diagnose it uh, better and uh, more accurately. So also just as background, some vocabulary, because we know this can be confusing to people living with Lewy body, uh, to the medical community and others. So it's important that we're just speaking in the same terminology. So Lewy body dementia, you may have seen this overarching umbrella before. Lewy body dementia is when we talk about the clinical features. So under that umbrella are two conditions that are labeled Parkinson's disease with dementia or PDD and dementia with Lewy bodies or DLB. Lewy body disease refers to the pathology. And here you can see a picture on the side of Frederick Levy, the pathologist who described these bodies and uh, neuronal loss that are seen only under a microscope that have his name. And these Lewy bodies contain protein clumps or aggregates of the protein alpha-synuclein. And here you can see a picture of what the Lewy body and alpha-synuclein look like under a microscope. There's something also called the one-year rule. And this is uh, along with criteria, clinical and the emergence of biomarkers help us distinguish the two conditions that fall under this umbrella of Lewy body dementia. And when we talk about Parkinson's disease dementia or PDD, we are typically referring to the context where someone has first had motor symptoms and then after many years develops dementia within the context of established Parkinson's disease. When we talk about dementia with Lewy bodies or DLB, and I'll be talking about both of these conditions a, a bit throughout today's presentation, we are talking about someone who has developed the dementia part or cognitive changes that are significant enough to affect their everyday life about at the same time or before they develop the motor symptoms. Okay. So these are the actual published criteria for dementia with Lewy bodies. They were first outlined in the mid 1990s and have undergone several different revisions with the most uh, recent effort published in 2017 and I'm delighted to have been part of this effort. And here you can see, uh, excerpted from the paper, the core features that are used to define dementia with Lewy bodies or DLB. So for starters, for diagnosis, the dementia is present and that has a little star next to it. And dementia is a syndrome of cognitive impairment affecting more than one cognitive area that is sufficient and significant enough to interfere with someone's everyday activities. Now you'll also see there are four other core features listed here, fluctuating cognition, where there may be changes in alertness and arousal uh, during uh, the day or over the course of weeks or different time periods. You'll also see recurrent visual hallucinations, something called REM sleep behavior disorder, where people may act out their dreams at night when they're supposed to be still, and then motor Parkinsonian features. So these list the core features for DLB clinical diagnosis. Not everyone will have all of these uh, uh, other symptoms um, listed under core outside of the dementia. And when they're present, not everyone will even have them to the same severity. So there's a wide spectrum of the clinical features, but also their 
severity and presentation. Now the criteria have also outlined several supportive clinical features that you'll see listed here regarding things like low blood pressure or uh, fainting spells, medication sensitivity, changes in smell, uh, changes in mood and neuropsychiatric features. And the criteria also included biomarkers. So today we're really going to talk about dopamine transporter scans, but there are other uh, biomarkers that have been incorporated into the criteria, such as sleep studies and a special type of heart scan that can be used to help support the diagnosis of dementia with Lewy bodies. Okay, so turning on before to talk a little bit about dopamine and dopamine transporters before we talk about the scans themselves. So what is dopamine? It is a brain chemical, a neurochemical that's found in the brain, but also elsewhere in the body. In Parkinsonian disorders, there is a loss of dopamine production and neuronal degenerations that's associated with the features that we think of in terms of Parkinson's and Parkinsonian conditions affecting motor phenomenology and non-motor symptoms like cognition, sleep, mood, autonomic function, and so forth. The dopamine transporters here you can see in the um, uh, cartoon that has the two arrows uh, depicts what we see as a nerve terminal. So dopamine gets produced in part of the nerve terminal and it travels its way through and it needs to make it to from the presynaptic side of the nerve to the postsynaptic side through uh, this little cleft and the dopamine molecules go from one part of the nerve to the other. Uh, here you can see uh, the dopamine transporter that's of importance in terms of Parkinsonian disorders focuses on this presynaptic side as you can see with the arrows. The dopamine transporter scans in a way are a marker of the integrity of what we call the nigro striatal system. So you may have heard of the substantia nigra, which is a part of a region in the midbrain of the brain that's filled with black pigmentary, hence its name substantia nigra. And those are where dopamine cells can be reduced or lost in Parkinsonian systems syndromes. The substantia nigra connects and talks to other parts of the brain called the striatum, which include the putamen and caudate and can be uh, affected in Parkinsonian syndromes and in dementia with Lewy bodies. All this is just to say that when we're looking at some of the pictures of the dopamine transporter scans, I'll show you some images that talk about the striatal system or the striatum. So I think it's important just to have some sense of where they are in the brain and how they're related to dopamine. And we're trying to pick up with these dopamine transporter scans uh, in a sense um, are the concentrations of the dopamine transporter affected in Parkinsonian conditions. And so that's what these scans will accomplish. Okay, the other important piece to understand are what are SPECTIN PET scans, because you'll hear this terminology. So they're not like x-rays or MRI scans, they actually use nuclear medicine. So they are produced by using radioactive tracers, typically delivered uh, intravenously, uh, that then uh, can measure different elements of physiology and uptake. So the SPEC scan stands for single, single photo emission computed tomography, and PET scan stands for positron emission tomography, and they work a little bit differently. So they each use different uh, technology to detect the tracers uh, after being injected. Uh, SPEC uses what's called gamma rays, and PET uses what are called positrons. So if you think about that, remembering electrons and ions from from uh, school. So an MRI will show you the anatomy. It'll show you the structure of what a brain looks like. But when we talk about these nuclear medicine scans, like the dopamine transporter scan, it shows the physiology, um, the uptake or changes within the dopamine uh, system and uh, at the 
level we think of where changes are happening in the brain. We'll see this picture below that's kind of in the greenish with the colored a number of times today, and that is actually what a dopamine transporter scan or DAT scan looks like. And I'll explain what the normal findings are and the abnormal findings in subsequent slides. So what's that in the history of the dopamine transporter imaging? Well, this goes back several decades now with early development of ways to image different neurochemicals and neurotransmitters. So this goes back to the 1970s with fluoridopa, which is one type of tracer element. And over the years, many others have been developed and they differ in their binding potential, how specific they are to the receptor and some changes in how they get metabolized and processed. The most commonly used one, uh, and you'll see this abbreviation a number of times in the, today's presentation is called uh, uh, 123, 123i, uh, FPCIT, which basically stands for ioflupane, and we'll talk a little bit about this in greater detail, and refers to what's now been um, approved and FDA approved and trademarked as the DAT scan. So this is the most commonly used radio ligand. Uh, it's been available in Europe since 2000 and approved by the US FDA in 2011. And here you can just see in this picture, there are a number of different types of SPECT and PET scans using different dopamine transporter imaging ligands. What they all share is they can demonstrate the normal pattern and these comma shapes that we'll go into a little bit more reflect that striatum, that anatomical part of the brain that I showed a few slides back that is involved in uh, dopamine and Parkinsonian syndromes. So this is what it looks like when it's normal and the uptake looks normal. But when there's uh, neurodegeneration and loss of dopamine, that amount of uptake and concentration changes and how it's produced on the picture that we see. So here you can see in examples of people with Parkinson's disease or PD, there is that dropout of that colorful tail end of the striatal uptake. And that's where we see reduced dopamine uptake. Um, we'll talk a little bit more of comma-like versus period-like shapes. Okay. So what is a DAT scan? All right, so we started talking about this already. Uh, it uses a radio ligand called ioflupane or I-123. If you wanna see the long chemical name, I've listed that here for you as well. Um, and it's a radioactive diagnostic agent. So a DAT scan is indicated as an adjunct to other diagnostic evaluations for striatal dopamine transporter visualization using SPECT brain imaging in adult patients. And it's been approved to look at two different indications. So suspected Parkinsonian syndromes or suspected dementia with Lewy bodies. And this information comes from the G healthcare package insert. So how is a DAT scan performed? So these are just a couple pictures uh, uh, taken from the internet that shows what to expect during a DAT scan, uh, DAT scan or SPEC scan and what the actual apparatus of the scanner looks like. So when uh, someone comes in for an appointment after they're checked in and prepped and everything, they are given iodine tablets to protect the thyroid from the radioactive substances. They need to wait a little bit so that gets through their system. And then the radio tracer for the DAT scan is injected. And then the person waits another couple hours while that uh, tracer uh, moves around through the body and into the brain. Then the scan is completed, and this is an example of what a scanner might look like. The actual scan varies in how much time it takes, but approximately is less than an hour. And then that scan gets uploaded into the computer system and sent along to the radiologist so they can interpret the results and then conveyed back to someone's doctor. So in terms of getting a DAT scan or dopamine transporter imaging scan, there are a few contraindications or caveats. 
So one would be hypersensitivity or allergy to the specific active substance that's being injected. Pregnancy is one as well. And then for some severe renal or hepatic insufficiency and breastfeeding is a relative contraindication. There are a few caveats that we'll talk about as well. One is that um, there can be an allergy to iodine substances, but that is not necessarily a full contraindication and requires more discussion with the medical team. There are certain medications, and this is an important caveat, stimulants and some antidepressants that can interfere with the dopamine uptake and thus the results of the scan. So it's always important to check with your physicians and radiology team to understand if this uh, scan is not only appropriate for you, but also that you are eligible and able to have the scan safely without any sorts of contraindications or caveats. I mentioned before that there are uh, certain medication interactions, and this is really quite important because for many people with dementia with Lewy bodies or Parkinson's or other neurologic conditions, they may be uh, on medications to treat neuropsychiatric symptoms such as depression or so forth. Uh, or they may be taking stimulants or appetite suppressants for other reasons. So because we're looking at the binding uh, of the dopamine transporter, it's important to know that there are some drugs that also bind to the same transporter and they get very tightly bound to it. And because of that tight binding of these other medications, it can interfere with the images that get produced and uh, based on the dopamine uptake and therefore the results and interpretations of the scans. So some of those drugs that bind to the dopamine transporter are, fall in the stimulant class, appetite suppressants, some, but I wanna stress not all antidepressants and some drugs of abuse like cocaine. And there are a few examples listed there. A number of studies have also looked at if a person with Parkinson's or dementia with Lewy bodies is taking dopaminergic medications like lethmodopa or dopamine agonists, can they have a scan and have it uh, interpreted accurately? And so a number of studies have looked at this and have found that if someone's taking levodopa, that is not expected to interfere with the dopamine transporter binding and uptake of the scan. Similarly for cholinesterase inhibitors like rivastigmine or donepazil and most antipsychotics should not impact the binding and the uptake and results of the scan. There are some selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors or SSRIs that may bind to the dopamine transporter, but it is thought that they should not interfere with the visual interpretation and results of the scan. With all that said, it's always important to again, check with your medical team and radiology team regarding any specific medications and weighing the risks and benefits of stopping some of these medications if they needed to be stopped ahead of time, you know, five or seven days before the scan. So sometimes that risk benefit uh, is more important to stay on that medicine than to take a chance of going off of it. Again, case by case basis. So in terms of specific populations, there is uh, language and um, guidance uh, in terms of getting a dopamine transporter scan or DAT scan. Uh, I'll just highlight a few, I'm not gonna read through all of these, but for uh, older adults, there were no responses, no differences in responses between elderly patients and younger patients that would require a dose adjustment. Similarly, for uh, uh, considerations um, with renal and hepatic impairment, uh, that has not yet been established, but the kidney is screened, uh, the DAT scan, and so if someone has severe renal impairment, that may have some implications. And then there are specific populations to address if someone's pregnant or lactating and its use has not been established in pediatric patients. Like all medicines in uh, uh, 
tests in some ways there can be adverse effects or side effects and things just to be aware of. In some of the clinical trials with DAT scan, those of adverse effects that have been present in trials included some mild symptoms, including headache, nausea, dizziness, dry mouth uh, of mild to moderate severity. In other studies, uh, people have reported anxiety or bruising at the injection site when the uh, IV tracer is injected. And then in some studies after marketing, uh, there have been reports of hypersensitivity reactions and injection site pain, all of these being of mild to moderate severity, but again, things to be aware of. So how is the scan interpreted? So there are a number of different techniques and I'll talk about these in a little greater detail of visual ratings or trying to quantify what we see in terms of degree of uptake. And then I think yeah, we're learning a lot for the use of machines to be able to do some of these readings of scans. Uh, so future research and time will give us more information on that. Okay, so here's a, a picture of what is the visual rating. And so you've now seen this image before. So this is the output of the image that's produced after someone has a DAT scan. And just to orient you on the top of the slide here um, would be uh, kind of the, the, where the nose would be in front of the head and on the bottom, the back of the head. Uh, and so here you can see what we call the striatum, the area of the basal ganglia, area of the brain that's affected in Parkinsonian syndromes associated with dopamine, including the uh, parts of it called the cauda in putamen with normal, uh, a normal read on the dopamine transporter scan. And in many cases, this has been described as looking like a comma. So think about it as that punctuation mark. But when there's degeneration of dopamine neurons and loss of dopamine, that comma becomes truncated to look more like a period shape where um, we lose the back part of the striatum or the tail of the putamen with that loss of dopamine. Now these scans can also be looked at in a more quantitative analysis with uh, different types of software where that degree of either uh, dopamine loss um, or looking more like the period shape than the comma can be compared to an index of what those uptake ratios would look like in a normal healthy non-Parkinsonian population. And from that, different ratios and numeric values can be calculated. And some uh, radiologists will use this to help determine uh, the abnormality or normality of the scan and provide uh, additional information. This type of information on the quantification can also be very helpful in research purposes to see uh, the, the numbers or a more quantitative assessment rather than just a visual uh, presence or absence type of scale. Okay, so a little bit more terminology and then I'm gonna talk, into, talk about their, their use more specifically. So we're gonna talk about some things that uh, I'll present as sensitivity or specificity. So this is a little crash course in what, the, what those mean. So when we talk about the sensitivity and specificity of a test, we're referring to the test's ability to correctly classify a person as having a disease or not having a disease alternatively. The sensitivity part is a test's ability to designate an individual with disease as positive. So having the disease a true positive. A highly sensitive test means that there are few false negative results and thus fewer cases of disease missed. Complementary to sensitivity is what we call specificity. And this is the test's ability to designate an individual who does not have the disease as negative. So someone who does not have the, the disease as a true negative. So a highly specific test means that there are few false positive results because you have more true negatives. 
but it may not be feasible to always use a test with low specificity for screening, since many people without the disease will screen positive and that can cause a lot of unnecessary worry and extra testing. So ideally you want a test that has both high sensitivity and high specificity, but this isn't always possible. And there are trade-offs and balances that, that we need to, to make. Um, so there are a lot of nuances about the relative value or importance in uh, different populations and how common the disease is, how critical it is for diagnosis, and in a sense, how willing um, we are to have the risk of having false rates. So it's desirable to have high rates of both, um, and I'll present some data on that. The other term called accuracy uh, combines specificity and sensitivity as the total number of correct diagnoses over the population that's included. So how accurate is the test? All right, so moving, moving on to talk a little bit more about using a DAT scan in the diagnosis of suspected Parkinsonian syndromes, which are abbreviated as PS here. So here you can see on the left part of the slide in blue, a number of different Parkinsonian syndromes that are listed. And as you may know, there are multiple uh, disorders and neurodegenerative diseases that are associated with uh, dopamine loss or changes in the dopamine system. These include Parkinson's disease and several others such, such as multiple system atrophy, progressive supranuclear palsy, cortical basal degeneration, and dementia with Lewy bodies. There are, and here you can see that's linked with that abnormal DAT scan that I spoke about before. But there are also non-Parkinsonian syndromes that can present with some overlapping clinical features, such as tremor or action tremor in the case of essential tremor, stiffness or slowness, and that and walking disorders that can make them difficult to distinguish from Parkinsonian syndromes due to dopaminergic loss or degeneration. And this is where the DAT scan has come in uh, handy and useful in being able to distinguish Parkinsonian syndromes from tremor or, or stiffness or dystonic or other non-Parkinsonian syndromes like essential tremor with high sensitivity and high specificity and excellent accuracy. So hitting some of those, those goalposts that I mentioned in the previous slide about having a test that is highly sensitive, highly specific, and that gives high levels of accuracy. One thing we've learned over the years is that among the Parkinsonian syndromes, so among Parkinson's, MSA, PSP, DLB, and cortical basal degeneration, we can't really use the DAT scan to discriminate uh, among each of those Parkinsonian syndromes. There's some research looking at this and perhaps looking at different subregions, uh, but by and large, its use is to di distinguish Parkinsonian syndromes as a whole versus the non-Parkinsonian ones. And these tests can be helpful, although clinicians and hands of specialists like movement disorder specialists, we can be uh, also highly uh, accurate and good about making the diagnoses. But we all know that uh, clinical uh, acumen is wonderful and highly established in trained professionals, but it isn't perfect. So sometimes having a test that provides objective evidence or confirmatory evidence in the setting of these clinical symptoms can be helpful in establishing an accurate and timely diagnosis. Okay, so what about changes in DAT scans over time in Parkinsonian syndromes? Well, this has been an area of uh, research and investigation. Typically, when we see that comma start to change into one of those period shapes, we typically see that first reduced on the side of the striatum, part of the brain that corresponds to the opposite part of the body affected. So if someone had tremor in their right hand or stiffness or slowness in their right hand, we might see that change in the left striatum. 
with time, this generally progresses to involve both sides of the striatum and both sides of the body clinically. Some studies have found that there might be a relationship between motor impairment and the degree of dopamine transporter binding, particularly in early stages of Parkinson's. But as the disease progresses and motor impairment becomes greater, those scan changes tend to reach what we call a floor effect, meaning in later stages, there isn't much difference from one time point to the next. And here you can see in uh, one of the um, image uh, PET scans, just an example over different hone and yar stages of Parkinson's. So hone and yar being a, a, a way that we can uh, talk about different motor stages from one side of the body to two sides, both sides of the body to balance impairment and more severe motor impairment or wheelchair use over stages one through five. And here you can see that in some of the later stages, the dopamine uh, signal does not look that much different. It might look more, the difference might be greater from early to more advanced than from moderate to advanced. Some studies like the Parkinson's Progressive Marker Initiative study that's followed early patients with Parkinson's over years uh, has found some longitudinal changes in this dopamine transporter binding. And that may be helpful to understand rates of progression. It's not thought that the DAT scan or dopamine transporter scans are uh, particularly good at predicting progression or response to therapeutics. So what about the clinical utility and Parkinsonian syndromes? So these are studies that looked at the use of DAT scan. Uh, and they found that uh, the clinical utility actually led to changes in diagnosis and changes in management. So this data comes from two studies, um, and they found that in about a third, the uh, information gained in a DAT scan led to a change in diagnosis. So that could be a change of establishing a Parkinsonian syndrome or saying, oh, we thought this was a Parkinsonian syndrome, but the DAT scan is negative and rethinking the diagnosis. It's also led to a change in management in uh, between 50 to 60 percent. And that change in management was either starting a new medicine, switching from one medicine to another, or stopping a medicine. So there are, as you can see, are real world implications of the information we get from tests like the DAT scan. There are also clinical and research goals some of which are currently happening and some of which are uh, goals for the future. And these include the use of DAT scans uh, as inclusion criteria for clinical trials. So in order to have a more uniform group of people in a clinical trials, it may be required to demonstrate dopaminergic changes on a DAT scan. We're also finding that uh, People who have REM sleep behavior disorder or reduced or loss of smell called hyposmia may also have uh, changes in their DAT scan. And we know that people who have those symptoms may be at higher risk for developing Parkinsonian syndromes. And also the future use, if we have agents that can stop or halt the progression of Parkinson's or dementia with Lewy bodies, this may provide opportunities for early detection in people. Okay, so just a little recap on um, some clinical features in dementia, because I'm going to talk a little bit more about dementia with Lewy bodies and Alzheimer's. So here you can see just a few fundamentals, the dementia with Lewy bodies and Parkinson's dementia, again, being part of that LBD umbrella in contrast to Alzheimer's disease. And there may be some shared features in terms of the cognitive symptoms, maybe a little bit of difference in the cognitive profile with greater memory and language affected on Alzheimer's. But here you can see that the presence of Parkinsonism or those motor features may differ from Lewy body dementia, including DLB, to present on occasion, but not a main feature of Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so we're going to talk more about the clinical utility of a DAT scan in dementia with Lewy bodies now more specifically.
the clinical diagnosis uh, in the hands of specialists, movement disorders, cognitive behavioral neurologists for making the diagnosis of dementia with Lewy bodies has had high specificity but low sensitivity, meaning there are opportunities for us to do better clinically. When people have donated their brains to science and we've looked at autopsy, we have found that there's a loss of the dopamine transporter in both Parkinson's and dementia with Lewy bodies. So this leads to the question of, can we detect this with a DAT scan? We also know in terms of making the clinical diagnosis of dementia with Lewy bodies, it can be quite challenging depending on the types of symptoms someone has present. Not everyone will have motor symptoms who has the diagnosis of dementia with Lewy bodies. There are situations where only one of those core clinical features beyond dementia may be present, meaning someone may have hallucinations, but not necessarily Parkinsonian features. And so we need to have something that will help us with the clinical diagnosis and be supportive of it, supportive of it. hence what we're talking about in terms of DAT scans. So there have been a number of studies looking at uh, the DAT scan in possible and probable dementia with Lewy bodies. Again, just a reminder that when we talk about definitive diagnoses, we're usually talking about autopsy validation. But when someone's uh, still living and we talk about probable DLB, we talk about having two or more core clinical features uh, and possible one core clinical feature, uh, just in a nutshell. So this one study looked at uh, a one-year follow-up of possible DLB, um, and 40% of these people remained in the possible DLB criteria. So they used the DATSAN to help identify. 100% of those, 100 of those people who received a non-DLB diagnosis, so thinking they didn't have DLB, had a normal DAT scan. So again, helpful to distinguish DLB from non-DLB. 63% of the Patients with probable DLB had an abnormal scan. So this demonstrated that high sensitivity and high specificity for using a DAT scan in a clinical population to differentiate DLB from non-DLB dementia. And that rate went up higher even when we looked at the autopsy confirmation and linking the clinical, the scan and the autopsy. DAT scans have look, been looked at too in some large multi-center trials in DLB as a way to distinguish probable DLB from other causes of dementia. So in this study, which dovetails on the previous study I just mentioned, there were uh, over 300 patients who had either the diagnosis of probable or possible DLB or a non-DLB dementia. And this was established by a consensus panel of experts. These patients then underwent DAT scan, which was looked at by three different independent readers who were not aware of the clinical diagnosis. And they used that visual rating scale to classify as the images as either normal or abnormal. And these results also showed that in a nutshell, the abnormal scans were highly sensitive uh, about 78% of detecting clinically probable DLB. And they were highly specific of about 90% for excluding non-DLB dementia, which was mainly due to Alzheimer's. So high accuracy, high sensitivity, high specificity for distinguishing DLB from non-DLB, mainly Alzheimer diagnosis. And this led to including the DAT scan or dopamine transporter imaging as a supportive feature in the revised criteria. So these studies have also had, uh, you know, what I would call real world impact. So this study looked at the effect of information from a DAT scan on diagnosis and confidence of the clinician. So this was a large multi-centered European study that looked at 187 patients over 55 years who had the diagnosis of possible DLB. And these patients were either randomized, uh, flip of a coin to get the scan or to not get the scan. 
And then the researchers looked at the proportion of patients who had their clinical diagnosis changed to probable DLB or not DLB at eight weeks and then later down the road at 24 weeks. And they also looked at changes in the clinician's confidence of diagnosis at eight and 24 weeks. And so this is what they found uh, in the three panels here. In the first one, they found that the change in diagnostic category was greater in the group that had a DAT scan at both eight weeks and 24 weeks than the group that did not get the scan. And here you can see that in the white, the white outlined bar compared to the blue bar. They also found that the confidence of diagnosis was similar at baseline. So everyone started out at about the same point, but the confidence at eight weeks and at 24 weeks was greater in the group that underwent imaging. Lastly, they found that the clinicians were more likely to change a diagnosis when the scan was abnormal. So that added information led them to make different diagnostic uh, decisions and um, greater at both eight weeks and 24 weeks. So this was a pivotal study that uh, looked at the diagnosis of suspected DLB, but people who had not only a DAT scan, but also when they passed away, donated their brain to science for autopsy study. And here you can see uh, that they compared the DAT scan results compared to the pathological and clinical diagnoses. Again, producing in summary, high accuracy, sensitivity, and specificity. And you can see that in, from the clinical diagnosis, there were 33 people with a clinical diagnosis of dementia with Lewy bodies. And at autopsy, um, uh, 30 of them had similar and confirmed diagnoses. Similarly, in Alzheimer's, that of the 22, uh, there were 21 who had an Alzheimer's diagnosis pathologically. But you can also see that there were some shifts in diagnosis uh, from the clinical to the autopsy, meaning that there were other diseases that the autopsy confirmed, such as cortical basal degeneration or frontotemporal degeneration. And then they looked at what was the DAT scan result. So in the people with autopsy confirmed uh, dementia with Lewy bodies, uh, most of the time the scan was abnormal, but here you can see there were three patients, which represented 10% that met the clinical and pathological diagnosis for Lewy body dementia, but they had normal imaging. So that leads to the question, well, what does that mean? Why did these people have false negatives? And we're going to explore some of that uh, in subsequent slides. So what about using the DAT scan in people with the diagnosis of Alzheimer's? Uh, and we're learning a lot that there can be a mix of pathologies from amyloid and tau and synuclein and vascular uh, disease and so forth in many neurodegenerative conditions. So these are just two examples. These are two studies that looked at DAT scan in patients who were diagnosed with Alzheimer's, but also had some of those mild Parkinsonian features. And I think that's a critical piece because the presence of these motor features implies in a way that the dopamine system is affected and therefore that dopamine uptake uh, should be altered and the scans may have a more like, be more likely to be abnormal. So in these studies, again, small studies uh, of these 29 patients with Alzheimer's and mild Parkinsonism, some of these patients had decreased dopamine transport or availability that was in between healthy controls and DLB. That was in one part of the striatum. Not all parts of the striatum differed between the Alzheimer group and the controls. Uh, so I think there's more to learn in terms of this, but the presence of motor symptoms may uh, imply that there may be changes in the striatal dopamine system. We're looking more uh, and more with interest in what we call prodromal uh, categories or prodromal elements of disease, meaning that can we 
identify people before they go on to develop dementia with Lewy bodies or Parkinson's in the case of Parkinson's. And we know that um, there's a lot that's still not understood in this and some controversy in how this is defined and how it progresses. But we know that people don't develop dementia overnight, right? It doesn't happen quickly necessarily. And they often go through a period of time where they may have mild cognitive symptoms or MCI, mild cognitive impairment, or other precognitive symptoms before they have dementia. Some people who develop Alzheimer's may have memory complaints and memory impairment before they develop the dementia. And so this study is looking at uh, uh, patients with mild cognitive impairment stage, so not meeting dementia criteria, and those including probable or possible MCI in the Lewy body, so precursors to dementia with Lewy bodies, and then some that had MCI and were thought to be precursors to Alzheimer's. And so again, using the DAT scan, uh, the study was able to show that there was high specificity, but kind of moderate um, sensitivity, although greater than 50%. So these DAT scans can potentially be used to identify people at the pre-dementia stage. It's not yet approved in this indication, but this is from a research perspective. So the sensitivity is lower in MCI compared to DLB, although 50% still had an abnormal scan. So this leads to more questions and hopefully future research in this opportunity. Similarly, um, what about MCI? And this is a, a recent paper that, again, uh, looks at can we use DAT scans to identify progressive dopamine loss in MCI that is associated as a precursor to dementia in Lewy bodies. Similarly, um, it was shown that with the DAT scan, one could identify decline in the striatal system in the MCI Lewy body group, but not necessarily in the MCI Alzheimer group. Again, separating those, those two groups and showing a decline over time. So there are challenges, as I mentioned. So DLD symptoms can vary from person to person. Not everyone will have all the core clinical features, including Parkinsonism. Uh, those who have Parkinsonism may have lower striatal dopamine uptake than those without, and therefore that may show up better on a scan. So remember that 10% that was um, clinically and pathologically confirmed but had normal dopamine transporter scanning, some of those people may not have had Parkinsonian symptoms or they may have had different degrees of symptoms. And that might be one reason why not all scans are positive. There may be copathologies present that influence different clinical presentations. And as I mentioned before, some but not all Alzheimer patients may have some mild motor features. So that leads to the question is can a DAT scan change over time? So what about those people who were, who were normal but had a clinical uh, diagnosis? And um, there's one study that looked uh, from Amsterdam at DLB patients with and without abnormal DAT scans at baseline, and then followed those people over time with repeat DAT scans uh, uh, about a year and a half later. Of the 67 scans, there were seven that were uh, rated as normal. So again, about 10% of people having a normal scan in the setting of a clinical definition. In five of those people, a second DAT scan was performed, and those scans at that later time point were abnormal. So this leads to the consideration that there may be rationale in some people with clinical symptoms of dementia Lewy bodies to have a repeat scan over time. So just in conclusion, I wanted to highlight a few of the benefits uh, of dopamine transporter imaging and DAT scans, that they can be helpful in establishing diagnoses, especially in uncertain circumstances. They can provide supportive evidence for clinical diagnosis and help confirm that, uh, that clinical diagnosis. They can help guide treatment. And as we saw, there were some changes in management decisions based on the information gained from a, a DAT scan 
And there can be humanistic considerations for timely and accurate diagnosis. So giving people information that they need, setting out on uh, a treatment plan and having um, impact on quality of life and decision-making. As I mentioned, they're often used in clinical research studies as inclusions. And in some studies in Europe, there's been evidence that the uh, scans may lead to some cost effectiveness in uh, cost savings. But I think there's more to understand about that, particularly in the US. Now, what about limitations? So one way to think about limitations are what can be technical factors related to the scam itself versus the uh, clinical uh, population and just other important considerations. So there can be technical factors, different types of scanner equipment, image quality, uh, artifacts, things that would interfere with the actual uh, image and their accuracy. There may be a variety of experience of different radiologists uh, and um, there's work being done in terms of training and making things so they're more homogeneous. There can be limitations to DAT scans based on clinical features, the contraindications that I spoke about, risk of radiation exposure, certain medicines that people might need to take, and other um, changes like a stroke in that same area of the brain in the striatum that might interfere with the visual rating. And then, of course, there are all these other important considerations, the effects on decision making and care and on cost, uh, knowing that um, Medicare uh, covers that scan, but commercial insurances uh, may vary in uh, what they cover and how much they cover. And so in summary, uh, I hope we've achieved our objectives to demonstrate that Dopamine transporter imaging and DAT scan can be helpful in distinguishing different clinical diagnoses. It does not replace a clinical diagnosis, but can be supportive and informative. Again, it's important to understand what a dopamine transporter scan means, the rationale for obtaining it, and the pros and cons, and importantly, what does one do with that information once one has it? There's research that's ongoing related to the use of these scans in what we call prodromal or early disease in combination with other biomarkers like heart scans or skin biopsies or cerebrospinal fluid and much more. And just to remember to always discuss with your, health, your healthcare team to understand if this is right for you and your care. And thank you and I'm happy to take a few questions. Excellent. Thank you so much. Here, I'll get us both on view. That was a fantastic presentation. Like, I learned a lot. <laughs> it's like, yay. <laughs> so much information. So much information. All right. So let's take a look here at the Q&A. Um, all right. So we have a great question here that um, the results of my DAT scan revealed that I had near normal dopamine in the left side of my brain, but I had no dopamine on the right side of my brain. Does that mean my LBD is more severe or it will progress more quickly? Great, and thank you everyone for all these questions. And I know we won't get to all of them uh, today, uh, but thank you for Julia for outlining that. Um, so the DAT scan results, so we'll see two sides of the sides of the brain those two sides do not always produce equal results on the imaging, and that may depend on um, the side that's affected first uh, in terms of the symptoms and different progressions that vary from one side of the brain to the other. So we don't have any really great sense as to why someone might have symptoms on the left side versus the right side. It doesn't have anything to do really with their handedness, um, but it means that, that if we see less dopamine transporter uptake on the right side of the brain, generally that person has greater motor or other symptoms on the left side of their body. It doesn't necessarily mean anything in terms of progression or rapidity of progression, but it helps tell a little bit on that localization of the different sides. Interesting. Thank you so much. All right. So we have one here that um, 
Oh, it moves. All right. <laughs> so their husband's been diagnosed based on the four LBD symptoms that you talked about. Um, and they were wondering, you know, they were told that the other symptoms are pretty indicative of Lewy body dementia and that the DAT scan isn't really needed. So would you agree with that? And if not, how could someone advocate um, to maybe, you know, or talk with their healthcare team about this if they feel it might be necessary? Yeah, I think that's a that's a really wonderful um, and important question. I uh, and it may depend on a number of different things. So, in um, much of medicine, I we like to weigh different risks and benefits of having a test itself and the knowledge of does that information change our management? Is that necessary? Uh, is that does the test uh, rationalized by the cost and the impact? And so I think there are a lot of topics that probably are under those layers. Uh, in many settings, there can be sufficient clinical symptoms that are um, you know, uh, important hallmarks of the disease and may be satisfying of the, the clinical diagnosis. Uh, particularly in the hands of specialists. With that said, we know specialists aren't perfect and we may be really, really good, but uh, not uh, infallible. And that's where uh, autopsy could come in. But then we ask, well, what can we do while someone's still living? And that's where some of these supportive tests may be helpful. So having a DAT scan to support that loss of uh, dopamine on a visualized scan Similarly, having an MRI of the brain might be needed to help exclude other causes or reasons for someone's symptoms. Now, I do know providers vary in, in their degree or of testing, or I don't know if it's willingness to test or pursuing, but I feel like it's always essential to have that dialogue and understand why people are making whatever decisions they're making. So uh, I would encourage uh, you to speak openly with your doctor um, and healthcare provider team to understand if it's right for you, if it makes sense, uh, is, it, is it worth the, the time and effort and cost, um, and what would that information do or change? So I did point out a few studies that showed that actually the presence of that information may have an impact on diagnosis and management. So uh, again, I think it's it's really meant to be a, a dialogue to understand um, that and share that decision making. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, this is a really good question, I think. Um, what is the function of dopamine in just uh, average, the average person? Oh, such a great, great question. I know we sort of just dove right into <laughs> to the problems with dopamine, but uh, dopamine, is a really essential and important brain chemical unto itself. It's involved in many functions, including uh, motor function, so smooth, coordinated, uh, uh, regular movements. Um, in part, we know that the lack of dopamine produces motor symptoms like tremor, slowness, stiffness. But dopamine is also involved in non-motor features like mood regulation and reward uh, and pleasure. So there are other elements of the brain that have uh, receptors that tie into dopamine function and are linked uh, to our perception and uh, sense of pleasure and reward. So that's where a little bit of that uh, impulse control behavior and disorders that uh, can happen in uh, Parkinson's patients where they may develop gambling or uh, hypersexuality or addictive like behaviors in the setting of some dopaminergic medications. And it's a little bit like that reward and pleasure system just got put on um, high alert uh, and, and triggered with a little bit too much um, pleasure and reward signals. So that's a fantastic question. Thank you. Absolutely. And I was going to ask you, Dr. Goldman, if you've ever seen the cute little cartoon and it says has dopamine and serotonin and it says technically the only two things you actually enjoy. 
So it's one of those nerdy cartoons that I really like. Fantastic. <laughs> so it kind of lays it out well. Um, here's another question I think is, is really interesting, and you did touch on this, um, but if one has to repeat a DAT scan, is there any certain interval that's ideal between scans? And they said, mm. thank you for the excellent detailed seminar. And she's looking forward to more lectures like this. So you got a little- oh. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. You're, you're welcome. And it's always a pleasure to be able to provide education and awareness. Uh, so I don't believe there's an exact ideal time for waiting. However, some of the studies that I presented have on average about a year and a half, um, which range between probably one to up to four years in those research environments. You know, one can think about this that one wants enough time to elapse to allow the possibility that there may be degenerative changes in those dopamine neurons to produce signal on the scan. So you'd want at least some period of time. Could that be a year? Um, I, quite possibly. Might it need to be longer? Uh, perhaps. Um, you know, I will say I think we sometimes do encounter this and I, that there is a need to repeat it for one reason or another. Um, clinical suspicion, uh, getting to know a patient over time and having different symptoms evolve over time. Perhaps there were artifacts or or issues with the, the ratings um, or interpretation. And so that also might be an opportunity to, to look at how the scan was interpreted and if there's a role for any of that more quantitative uh, analysis. And that's really a conversation with one's physician, healthcare team, that then usually talks to the radiology team to even see if those sorts of things are, are possible. Um, but then sometimes a repeat scan uh, is needed down the road and can be informative. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so we always get a lot of questions about genetics. And so any comments that you want to make to genetics would be welcome. But here's a question that I feel like they kind of link in the genetics. So um, this individual says, my mother and her siblings had autopsies confirm confirming LBD. Um, they're 68. And would it be recommended to have a DAT scan to see if there are any signs of early potential Lewy body dementia? Yeah, that's um, kind of two part question there. So just to talk about genetics in general associated with Lewy body dementia. So most cases are non-familial or non-genetic. However, with that said, there's um, a smaller percentage and that rate depends on you know who you quote and who you read, but a smaller percentage of people may have uh, family histories or genes associated with Lewy body dementia. Uh, there have been a number looked at in both uh, the Parkinson's world in the dementia with Lewy bodies world for different types of genes, some of which can be tested uh, in clinical and or research settings. So if there's suspicion of a genetic history, um, and or pathologic confirmation in other family members, it may be important to talk to a geneticist or neurogenetics counselor to understand should they be tested themselves if they're not currently having symptoms. And so I think having that counseling piece is always uh, a critical one to make a decision. What does this mean if I get tested for a genetic condition? What does it mean if it's positive or negative, and what do I do with that information? Now, the second part of the question um, had to do with getting a DAT scan if someone's not having any clinical symptoms, but they have a family history of dementia with Lewy bodies. And right now, we unfortunately, hopefully I'm not always going to say this in my presentations, but right now we don't have a cure, uh, and right now we don't have uh, disease modifying or neuroprotective proven treatments, meaning someone can take a pill or do something that will then prevent them from developing dementia with lower bodies or stopping it 
when it's present or slowing its presence down. There's a lot of research going on in those areas. So without those elements, it becomes a greater question of testing for something if someone doesn't have symptoms or may never get symptoms. Uh, so I think many people uh, would not advocate for testing in that scenario, um, but might think about enrolling in a, a research trial that follows people over time and gets that information might be you know, a consideration. Uh, but in the future, if we have agents that will change the disease course, then I think it becomes also a different question. Absolutely. Absolutely. We have a couple of great questions about medication. So I'll see if I can tie a couple of them together. So someone asked if a DAT scan could determine if dopaminergic medications would help. And another person asked, you know, if you could give an example, there was that one study that showed where they, there might be medication changes based upon a DAT scan. So is this an example of one of those or could you give an example? Uh, so in terms of medic, sorry, Julia, just in medicines to. Oh yeah, so medications, <laughs> would there, could you give an example of a medication change that might happen from a DAT scan? Got it, okay. Um, so if someone had a clinical diagnosis, hypothetically really, you know, of, of something that seemed like a essential tremor or an action tremor, that wasn't necessarily Parkinsonian, but maybe it wasn't so clear cut and, and, and dry. And that person had a DAT scan and it showed dopaminergic changes. Uh, one might think of medication adjustments to treat the tremor differently with more dopaminergic uh, agents we think of in Parkinson's to stop other medicines that might be used for essential tremor that don't really help in Parkinson's. And then I think Im importantly to take a look at the big picture and what does that new diagnosis mean to the person and their family uh, in, in terms of a condition, uh, you know, what does it look like over, over years? What other symptoms might we need to look at? What other therapies, the role of exercise, all sorts of other, other management topics. Um, so I think it's a balance. I think treating the clinical person in front of us is always probably still the most important, but that added information can open up other possibilities of medicines someone might not need to be on or might benefit from taking. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, we're getting a lot of questions about other types of biomarkers. And so I'm going to see again if I can kind of merge these questions. So someone reports that their spouse had a lumbar puncture that was inconclusive, that they exhibit a lot of signs and symptoms of LBD. So they're asking instead of doing another lumbar puncture, would a DAT scan be a better option? Some people have asked about the skin biopsy. So I don't know if you want to touch on that here or another point. Uh, yeah, I'll try to put them all all together, and we're uh, we're living in a time frame that's also very exciting for ways to be able to diagnose uh, what we call synucleinopathies, or the presence of those synuclein aggregates that are found in in Lewy bodies through uh, non-brain material. So, looking at through the cerebrospinal fluid that bathes the the brain and spinal cord, looking at the skin through biopsies um, uh, that can uh, show the presence of synuclein. And so I think that's uh, an area that um, has become very, very, very timely. And uh, we're trying to understand too the timing of those changes from where we detect synuclein to when and where we might see changes on a dopamine transporter scan. Uh, so I do think there is a role of using them together, uh, perhaps more even in the future, uh, to understand if one is positive but the other's not, or if they're both positive, or if there's synuclein that's present but not dopamine transporter imaging, is that something that we follow over time uh, and, and so forth. So, you know, I think we always are on the lookout for tests that are uh, 
sensitive, specific, accurate, and ideally non-invasive. So having a scan um, poses opportunities that, you know, getting a biopsy or lumbar puncture, um, you know, doesn't need to entail. Excellent. Thank you. And then this will be our last question here. So we've had a few questions about distinguishing between Parkinson's disease, dementia, and dementia with Lewy bodies. So can the DAT scan make that distinction? And do you feel that's important for people to have that distinction? Oh, that's, um, that's a question that's, you know, even still hotly debated in the field uh, and the lumpers versus the splitters under that LBD umbrella. So both parts of that umbrella, Parkinson's dementia and dementia with Lewy body share many clinical features. So from cognitive, neuropsychiatric, sleep, motor, uh, et cetera. And they also may share that uh, uh, dopamine transporter imaging finding that's abnormal in, in both cases. Uh, I did mention there are some DLB where it's not 100%, it's you know maybe 90 some odd percent. Um, so that's an area to learn more about. Pathologically, uh, they both can have uh, similarities, but also um, some differences. And then in terms of the time and the progression and first symptom or later symptoms, there can be some differences. So I do think Although there's a lot of shared, shared, sharedness, similarities, and, and overlap that lends us to put them all together, and there's a lot of merit for that. It's important that we remember some of those nuances uh, in terms of care and research and interpretation of studies. Absolutely. Well said. <laughs> nice way to, to navigate the lumpers versus splitters discussion. <laughs> you guys, that is a real, that is a hot topic and has been for a very long time. So nicely done. All right, you guys. So thank you so much. Unfortunately, we're out of time for more questions. Um, I always take a look just so you know what the questions following. And if they're ones that, that I feel like we weren't really covered during the topic, a lot of times you may receive an email from us. Um, sometimes I'll reach back out to the presenter or I'll find find the answer where I can and get it to you. So I want to start by thanking Dr. Jennifer Goldman for her amazing presentation um, and, and for all of you for taking your time to show up and join us for this session today. Um, on behalf of LBDA, I want to thank you for your time and, and also a reminder again, because we get a lot of emails about this, you will get an email in about a week with a link for the recording of the presentation. Or like I said, you can go to our YouTube YouTube channel. So if you go to YouTube and put in LBDA TV, um, you can find our recorded webinars at any point. So keep an eye on your email and visit our events calendar at lbda.org for some upcoming um, surprises. And we'll also have some live webinars coming out again in 2024. So a reminder, please take a moment to complete that survey when you log off today, because I've literally been using what you're telling us to plan our our session for 2024 and what content is going to be there. So let me know what you want to know about. Um, again, thank you all. I hope you have a wonderful holiday season. And again, thank you to Dr. Goldman. And hopefully we'll see you back again in 2024 to, to inform and enlighten us and empower us with some more amazing information. Thank you all so much. Have a great day.